on this nice sunny day. <coughs> Finally, we got some decent weather. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Patrick Bassfield. Patrick Bassfield. Uh, he's been employed with the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency as a biologist for the past uh, 22 years. In 2008, Patrick was hired as the monitoring coordinator of the Watershed Pollution Road Monitoring Network, the statewide river monitoring network of 199 monitoring sites. The program was designed to determine the spatial and temporal differences in water quality and track water quality trends. Patrick received his undergraduate degree from the University of Minnesota and in Duluth and a master's degree in forest hydrology from the University of Minnesota at St. Paul. All right. So I remember a seminar class. I loved it because you didn't have to do anything. But <laughs> but it's three o'clock Friday afternoon, first sunny day in a long time, a warm day. I feel sorry for you guys. I know your your hearts are not you know in this classroom right now. But but hopefully I've got some some stuff that that you guys can use. I I don't know background wise. Uh, um, tell you what, like five seconds each name and and your degree and what you're you're pursuing. Do, you, do we have time for that? Do you mind? Okay. Okay. Well, well, got you. Okay. All right. Doug, I'm a water resources science student, studying stormwater. Okay. Great. Three same program studying like. So limnology then is okay. Great. I'm a paying line with water resources. Oh, man. you're going to love this presentation. Really? Okay, wonderful. And let's start on computer science. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. And we're going to get Tish in the back and yeah. Okay. And your name? Anne. Anne, okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Like John said, my name is Pat Bashfield, and I, I've worked for the, the MPCA for quite a while. I I started out in St. Paul for a year and a half, and then I moved to um, a small town called Medellius between, uh, Lake, well, it's, it's south of Mankato, about 30 miles. But where I've been really fortunate, you know, I, my undergraduate degree was totally unrelated. I, I you know, I've always loved the outdoors. You know, I, I loved water resources and ended up going back to grad school. Ken Brooks, you know, gave me a shot. And, you know, he was just he was just top notch. But but I consider myself very fortunate because this is kind of my passion. I've always loved the water. You know, rivers until I moved south. I never spent a lot of time on rivers. But uh, but I, I I moved to a place that's on the Wadwan River. It's a tributary to the Blue Earth, which flows into Minnesota. And so I see a lot. And I live out in agricultural country and and. And like I said, I've always loved the water, but after I moved down there, what what I was saying, you know, it, it, it bothered me. You know, it was uh, these resources that we have in the state, they're, they're fabulous, you know. And, and you know, I, I remember my kids. I've got twins that were, they were born a couple of days before we moved down there, and I've got a, another daughter that's a little older. But, but when my twins were four years old, they had been down in Medellin for four years, and, and we were at this lake called Lake Crystal, which is, you know, it's kind of my go-to lake. Is you know, if the, the, anybody from the news calls and wants some kind of an algae story, you know, there's always an algae bloom going on in Lake Crystal, so we go there. But but I was here with the kids one time, and 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 there was a little beach, and and um, you know, and and we kind of walked up to it, and they were just grossed out. We didn't go in the water, but we went up north, you know, like a month later, and 
And, uh, you know, when we're at this lake, I said, come on, kids, let's, let's go down and go swimming. And, and they just were horrified. They said, you know, wait, you know. And, and I thought, man, that's wrong. You know, so so my job down there, I, I see a lot of things that need improving. And I've always had such a hard time taking what I see. And even though we have numbers, you know, trying to put that together. You know, if, if I present numbers, people get bored, you know, so I try and mix things up with pictures and I bought a drone and I'll show you some of that stuff. But I just wanted to get the data. My biggest goal was to get the data out. What I see, I wanted other people to see. And, you know, hopefully by doing that, you know, then they could push, you know, the legislative officials and change would happen. And I think we're kind of the, to that point. You know, we've got an application that will show you where, we, you know, with the Clean Water Legacy funding, we, we have 199 monitoring sites. We sample the daylights out of them. We're really trying to figure out what's going on. And I, I ran across a, a guy at our agency that uh, knows this application called Tableau. And uh, he had created a couple of applications with air quality data. And I looked at it and I thought, yeah, you know, we could, we could do this with the daily stuff, the annual stuff, and, and the average stuff. I just mentally started kind of making a, a roadmap and talked to him. And he said, yeah, I think I can do that. And he did a fabulous job, and I'll, I'll show you that a little bit. But what I'm, how I'm going to start out here, um, I'm going to go through our program background a little bit first, give you an idea of my glass. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, there we go. All right. So the objective of today's talk, I'll give you a little bit of a background on the Watershed Pollutant Load Monitoring Network. And then I've got kind of an example of, you know, and, and this is centered in the, the Blue Ridge River Basin, but it's an example of different scales of our data and how that's used to, to help us figure out what's going on. And then after that, we'll go into this application, the, the WPLMN Data Viewer. Okay, uh, goals. Um, John had read the goals, and, but the, the goals of the program, it's a long-term monitoring program. What separates us from what's been done before, um, a lot of the previous monitoring, you know, we had a program called the Milestone Program, and that was, it was monthly or bi-monthly sampling, um, you know, for, I, I believe it was five months, you know, two out of five years, something like that. I mean, it was a real, a real, uh, more of a temporal data set. If you really want to figure out what's happening pollution-wise, you got to be out there when the water's flowing. Most of these parameters that we look at, there's there's pretty strong concentration flow relationships, and and so a lot of the original data it, it didn't catch a lot of the dynamics that we're that we're picking up. So within this program, we've got 199, 199 monitoring sites. We've got three levels of scale. We have uh, basin sites, and those are located on the the basin rivers, uh, the Mississippi, Minnesota, St. Croix, Rain Red, you know, and we've got uh, a couple of lesser basin rivers. We have major watershed outlets. Those are eight digit huts that feed these basin rivers. And then a couple of years into the program, <coughs> my supervisor at the time, he wanted to expand the network. And, um, you know, we debated that for a long time, but but we finally did. We, we you know, since the funding was there, we expanded and we added sub watershed sites. So within these eight digit huts, we added you know, nested watershed or nested subwatershed sites at uh, pertinent locations. And what we look at, uh, we look at sediments, nitrogen, uh, nitrates plus nitrate nitrogen, and, and total Keldahl nitrogen, which is ammonia and organic. And and we look at a couple of fractions of phosphorus. We look at total phosphorus, and we look look at dissolved orthophosphorus. You guys know what these? Well, I suppose some of you guys don't know what these these parameters do. Sediment. You know, it's, it's, it's hard on aquatic life. Um, you know, it's got to be filtered if you're pulling drinking water out of the river. It doesn't look very good, um, you know, from an aesthetic standpoint. Or I, I fish the river quite a bit. When the rivers get dirty, you're, you're wasting your time. Um, you know, it, it reduces species diversity. A lot of, a lot of you know, carries, um, can carry absorb, pesticides, herbicides, other things. Uh, phosphorus likes to stick to sediment. Um, so sediment, not good in the rivers, you know, when it's at high concentrations like this picture, obviously. Uh, phosphorus, it's the limiting nutrients in fresh water. There's enough of everything typically to grow um, algae except phosphorus. You add more phosphorus, you grow more algae. Nitrogen in, 
in uh, marine environments, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus both play a, a role, but nitrogen plays a larger role in, in marine environments. In freshwater environments, um, a, a lot of these, these harmful algae, um, they, can, they can grab atmospheric oxygen and, and uh, basically pull what they need out of the atmosphere. So th those are the, the main parameters that we look at. Uh, this is yellow dots are the actual sample concentrations. The solid green primals, those are discharge, daily discharge. Um, and then we have these, you can see on the rising limb here, these hollow green triangles. Those are our estimated concentrations. So we've got a program uh, called Flux32. I, I worked with a guy, Dave Sabali. He used to work for the Corps of Engineers. And, and there was an old method in Flux that nobody really knew about, and I you know, started asking him. And, and basically, what, what and, and this is for you guys, not you know, the, the people that know nothing about, uh, uh, about water resources. But what this program does, it, we can create multiple concentration pool relationships. You know, if we see that uh, snow melt runoff is different than the spring storms, we can create separate concentration pool relationships to try and pr predict concentrations on days when we're not sampling. But what this program also does, um, it, it will apply a correction factor that's computed by interpolating between the sample residuals, the log residuals, and adding this value to the regressed value, um, which you know I, I know that's that's a lot. But what this does is it allows us to not do strict interpolations between these samples, but it's a combination of an interpolation and a regression. So what we do is we really sample the rising winds of these events very heavily, you know, because that's where we see water quality dynamics are the most, you know, they're, they're just or water quality uh, results are the most dynamic, and we see just wild stuff happen. So we we kind of oh I don't know we we go against a lot of the sampling protocols of random samples. We want biased samples because we're taking advantage of that. With this interpolation function, you know, yesterday's sample or today's sample, you know, providing nothing happened will depend on yesterday's concentration, you know, related. So we take advantage of that with this program. But but the point I want to make is uh, we sample a lot and we sample when we need to be out there. And this program, if the sampling is right, does a fabulous job of, of estimating these daily concentrations. Okay, data uses. So what do we do with this data? We do statewide comparisons of water quality. Uh, we can use this to prioritize watershed restorations. Uh, if you get in and start taking a look at the, the daily data, we can, you know, it helps us determine uh, pollute sources. And of course, we can do trend analysis on, on this stuff. So what I'm gonna do now, this is a, a piece of a presentation. I had you know, a couple of local groups you know, want to know what's going on. I live in the Mankato area, like I said. They wanted to know, hey, what in our area, what's the water quality like, and you know, are we affecting the Mississippi River? And you know, so I, I thought uh, of, of just some common questions that these people would ask, and and I'll answer those questions as we go along. And the first is, you know, what is the water quality like throughout Minnesota? And so these are maps that are created with with our our major watershed sites. So these were the eight-digit um, huck sites, and what we've got here. These are, it's a statistic called the flow rate of mean concentration. It's a volumetric average. It's like if we took uh, from the Cottonwood River, if we took all the water that went through the Cottonwood, put it in a big tub, stirred it, and grabbed one sample, you know, and, and I'm talking for the year, that sample would represent all the water that came down the river for the year. So, you know, basically we, we, uh, we give more weight to the concentrations that occur under high flows. But what's really great about this statistic, it tells you how dirty the water is that's coming through a watershed. So you can compare the Cottonwood to the Rock Monk, the Blue River to you know the Kettle River, anything. It's 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 the best statistic we have from a comparative standpoint. But if you take a look at these, I mean, there's there's definite trends. Um, if you take a look at the western part of the states, you know, the northwest on down, that's Red River Basin, highly agriculture, come down, and uh, a buddy of mine works for the Department of Ag. He calls it the Fertile Crescent, but the southern part of the state, we've got the Minnesota River Basin, and then southeast Minnesota. But you can see those are generally where we have the most impaired water quality. The exception is when you go to nitrate and you take a look at the Red River Basin. Um, nitrate, if it's 
you know, if, if nitrate concentrations are high and it travels through the soil profile, the nitrogen will get denitrified loss of the atmosphere. In the southern part of the state, you've got a lot of subsurface tile, and I've got some pictures that'll show you that. It's drainage tile. And so it kind of short circuits this whole process. So the water infiltrates, pick up, picks up nitrogen, it's water soluble, or nitrate, nitrogen, and <clears throat> goes into the tile lines right to the river. So we see real high concentrations where, where in agricultural lands, tile exists. Tile does not exist at anywhere near the density of the Minnesota River Basin, up in the Red River Basin. So that's why that's, you know, got very low nitrate concentrations. Although we are seeing, we are seeing the numbers start to pick up. We're seeing more tile in the southern part of the basin. The numbers are, are starting to go up. But this is, these are, you know, it's a great series of maps, you know, to look at kind of the, the regional patterns that exist. And, and, you know, if you get in and start looking at the scales, I mean, we have some huge differences in concentrations. If you look at here in South Southern, this part of the state, We've got flow rate and mean concentrations, so one to two milligrams a liter. We get down to this part of the state, the blue is the mature. You know, we're up to 200 and, you know, 170, I think, is our average flow rate and mean TSS concentration for the blue, or 246 for the mature. So numbers that are, you know, hundreds of times higher than, than the cleanest parts of the state. And if you, you know, we obviously, you know, we'll take a look at, at why this is happening. And, and land use, that's, Agricultural regions. Southeast, a lot of ag down here. Um, you don't have the tile, but you have karst um, geology, a lot of fractured limestone. So, from a, a nitrate standpoint, that stuff will travel through the southeast pretty well. And as far as soils, I mean, last research, these are the best soils for farming. You know, so we can't blame everything on farming. We have the youngest soils are the most nutrient rich. We are going to have higher concentrations in those areas, even under natural natural conditions. So what we know, number one, streams and rivers within areas of the state with the most fertile soils and most disturbed landscapes have the most impaired water quality. So we we kind of started, you know, big scale. Now we'll we'll start honing in. So so what about the water quality in the Mankato area? Let's see. I think I'm going too fast now. Yeah, this this is one of my favorite fishing spots. This is a river I live on it, and you know, just to show you how much the water quality can change. This was, I think this was like within a week of Thanksgiving. Um, I, I forget what year that was, but it was it was November. You can see we've got, you know, sand on the, the bar. Um, this is the same spot on the river. Um, Medelia is upstream. They had, they've got a, a, a processing plant, a lot of fats going in the river. I mean, when I first moved down here, I'd, I'd go in the river and I'd come out and you'd be sticky, you know, and I'd wash the, the water up. And so in the summertime, we'd get these, these diatom booms and the stuff would go on the bottom. And then about 3 o'clock, you know, just some of the gas bubbles that would produce would bring the stuff off the bottom. And it was, it was just incredibly disgusting. But, but, you know, the next morning, it would look normal again. You know, stuff would, you know, the gas vacuoles would, would burst or whatever. I, you know, I'm not sure how this stuff operates. But it was just really strange to see that. But, but that shows you, you know, just, just how diverse this river can be from a, an aesthetic standpoint. So, okay, so now we're going we're gonna to hone in. These are, uh, I've got a, a series of maps that we call our lock and dam number three maps. And so to get a relative feel, lock and dam number three, it's the first downstream point on the Mississippi River after the Mississippi and the St. Croix and the Minnesota River come in. So, you know, we, we wanted to get a relative feel of, you know, what are the loads coming from each of these contributors to the metro area. So we, you know, if we take the average load from the Minnesota River at Fort Snelling, divided by the average load of lock and dam number three, it's the equivalent of 78% of that. Um, St. Croix, you know, 5%, you know, hardly anything. Mississippi River at the Nolka, about 20%, and most of that comes in the Crow, South Fork of the Crow, North Fork of the Crow, the, you know, just kind of getting into that agricultural watershed. But you can see it's a really disproportionate amount of sediment coming from the, the Minnesota River Basin. And if we look at the other parameters, nitrate and phosphorus um, from the Minnesota River Basin, 
uh, 72% of that nitrate load or the equivalent of 55% of the phosphorus. You know, the numbers aren't, you know, they, they add up pretty well, but they're not meant to be additive. You know, some of this will settle out and we'll pick up additional sediments. And the same between all of these sites. But it gives you a real good feel for where this stuff is coming from. If we, if we zoom in a little bit more, you know, we, I did a couple of other sites on the Minnesota River. Uh, this is Judson. And this is St. Peter. Between these two locations, we have the Blue Ridge River coming in, and its tributaries of the Wat Wan and Old Sewer. So I, I did the same analysis with the loads from the this is the Eagle Sewer, this is the Blue Ridge, and this is the Wat Wan River. And you know we've got the equivalent of uh, what do we got there? Fifty-five percent of that Lock and Dam Number Three load. From the Blue Earth River Basin alone, you know, so huge disproportionate amount of sediment coming from that area. And this is only seven and a half percent of the total drainage area of you know, above Lock and Dam number, number three. Oh, and and I I didn't have the other parameters up on top. Thirty percent of the nitrates from from the Blue Earth River Basin, twenty two percent of the phosphorus. Metro area does does you know kick in some phosphorus. They've done a great job reducing the numbers. But you know we we still you know from from this we see that this the metro area does contribute some phosphorus. So what we know number two a great deal of pollutants reaching Lake Pepin originate from the Minnesota River Basin with a vastly disproportionate contribution from the Blue Earth River Basin. So when is this stuff coming through? The reason I put this in is in in my area of the state, um, you know I, I live surrounded by farmers and they're great people. They they really are. But nobody likes to be called a polluter, you know. So I, I, you know, I get all kinds of guys that will go out and grab a sample in August when, you know, the, the, maybe the, the tile lines are all shut off and they'll grab something out of a ditch and, and basically that's just a little groundwater coming in at that time. And they'll say, look, there's no nitrogen in my water. You can't tell it's, you can't tell me it's coming from us. But that's because it's collected, you know, this time of year. When you really want to find out what's going on. Basically, you've got to go through the period when the water is going down the system. If we take a look at these are monthly loads, sorry, I should have prepped this out, but we can see for the Watt One River TSS monthly loads, we've got 75% of that occurring in a four month period, and that's really important. And if you look at flow, which are the blue bars, you can see that's when the flow is going through the river as well. We have the winter months, and then we have, uh, you know, Basically, a period where the canopy is closed and that intercepts a lot. And a lot of it, uh, you know, it uh, will infiltrate the, when the raindrops, you know, hit the leaves. They break into, you know, it knocks the blossom down. But they break into smaller, smaller droplets, and they, they will. They're much better at infiltrating. So we see a lot less overland flow in in August, July, August, and September than we do in the other months when the crops are not or the trees do not have leaves. So what we know on average, approximately 75% of the pollutant loads going through the Blue Earth River Basin um, occur between March and June. And I, I did that with multiple other sites throughout the state as well. And the same thing occurs. You know, it's not just, you know, it's because it's an agricultural area and it's drained. And certainly once the crops are up, you know, they pull in a lot of water. But a lot of this has to do with canopy development. Uh, to go to the northern part of the state, basically you just shift this over so it's able to be on the July that we can see the boats going through. So there's a real period when this stuff is going down. So this has been a huge bone of contention in in my neighborhood for a long time. Where's the sediment coming from that enters our local rivers? And um you know and, and there's a lot of different answers. But a lot of times those answers are the they're right. You know, if, if you go down one or two years, oftentimes those years can be very different than the following two years. So you really have to do this over a long period of time to find out, you know, okay, what is the average load? How much does this vary? You know, what, is, what happens with snow melt runoff? What happens with, with high intensity events before the canopy's up, after the canopy's up, et cetera? Okay, this is kind of cool. So, and, and this is what I've learned, you know, I, I saw some researchers a few years ago come back and they said, yeah, you know what, it's stream bank and it's bluff erosion. It was originally near channel and then it kind of shifted to bluffs. 
you know, and I'm seeing, you know, horrible stuff happen on fields, and, and yeah, there's a ton of screenback erosion. You know, I, I don't dispute that for a bit. But these guys were out in a couple of years where the high-intensity rain events really didn't occur. Um, you know, so to, to take, you know, uh, the results from a couple of years and extrapolate that on, it wasn't what I was seeing in the landscape. You know, so that really kind of kind of drove me to to make sure that you guys have the data and hopefully the picks before I retire to, to kind of carry this on. But this, the overlet surface runoff, I'm going to show you a video here. Hopefully this works. So I, I bought my own drone. I don't fly this on company time um, because it is kind of contentious. You know, PCA was worried, you know, people are going to think that we're all spying on them. This is right across from my house. I took the drone off from my, from my yard. And, and this is what I see, you know, usually a couple of times a year we get high intensity events. When you get a big one, this is probably three inches of rain. You know, this is a plant landscape, but it's so connected when you get a lot of water. And, and, and these are really bad. You know, I, the guy I bought my, my house from, you know, I'm, I'm talking to him after one of these, and he's looking at the water out in the field, and we're looking at the stars on the landscape. And, and I said, yeah, God, Phil, you know, you know, some of the stuff we, we could do some stuff with. And he goes, yeah, but, you know, it only happens a couple of times a year. And I thought, well, yeah, a couple of times a year, but how much of the load is that? You know, and, and so I got in, and you'll see later on, and I dealt a little further. So now I flew to the other side of the river, you know, up on this hillside. You know, the erosion was so bad. That's it eroded down to some of the tile lines, you know, it's about little little ravines, and that's the water going into the river, you know, from that event. And that's just that's just one one field, and that's okay, you know. In up here, you know, if that were coming off a construction site, I guarantee you there'd be fines to be paid. In my neighborhood, that's okay. Okay, so that's surface runoff. Another source, and, and, and I'm talking watersheds like the Blue Earth and Lassure, we have ravines. The Blue Earth and Lassure, Minnesota River is about 200 feet. I don't know if you guys know anything about the Minnesota River. It's an old glacial river. It was glacial river war and carved this huge valley, Drain Lake Agassi. So now you've got a river, uh, a very undersized river in this huge valley, but draining Lake Agassi, it obviously did a little little bit of erosion. So we've got a, an upland that's farmed about 200 feet above the river. So what we see with these tributaries as they cut down to the Minnesota River, we'll see flat landscapes, river 200 feet below, and then oftentimes, you know, the water that travels that expanse, that slope stance, it, it gets canalized in, in ravines form. And so I'm going to show you a couple of pictures here of a ravine. I look kind of I look kind of crabby, don't I? Mm -hmm. so I'm pour the other half of that down the back of my pants, looks like. But but this is the ravine head, and, and you can see this water is pretty clear. We didn't take a TSS sample with that. I would say that's probably 50, 60 milligrams a liter, something like that, standard 6 and 5. So that's that's probably pretty close to the standard. Then I went down. It's not the bend point. It's just the, the first road or the only road on this, this ravine. And and you can see it's not a very good picture, but uh, but you know certainly the water. I'm just amazed at how much sediment we picked up in such a short distance. But then we go down to the outlet of this thing, and this was a couple of hours after we grabbed the upland sites. We went and other stuff, but this is what you see. I mean, this this water is horrible. You know, we've got a standard of 65 milligrams a liter. I've seen samples, you know, 11,000, 15,000 milligrams a liter. You know, so it's very short lived. It's like water running off a parking lot. It's kind of short lived. But it's incredibly dirty, really, really dirty stuff. So ravines, they can be a real bad one. This was, these are pictures taken by a, a developer, uh, Kurt Fisher. Um, he lives on the Blue Earth River, and I put these in. You know, this is a tile line coming in, you know, on, on uh, a block above or right across from Kurt's house. And, you know, I just wanted to show you the, the contrast between that water and the blue at that time was, was pretty clean. Okay, and bank and bluff erosion. Which, which bank and bluff erosion, natural process. 
in the southern part of the state where there's agricultural tile going on, this is what it looks like. These are perforated pipes laid every 40, 50 feet. And, you know, since, boy, 2008 on, tons of tile. I mean, there was a lot of tile in before then. A lot of it was older, you know, turn of the century. You know, some older clay tiles were laid. <laughs> they ramped it up big time. You know, I mean, now it's it's the low depressional spots. It used to be open tile and chase kind of surface green. Now a lot of these are pattern tile and, and, and they drain very effectively. But what's happened is, you know, with everything pattern tile, tiled, that goes to larger tile, which goes to larger tile, which, you know, eventually goes to these things called mains, tile mains, and, and you know, it's much like a storm sewer. So what I'm saying is all these mains are being replaced with, with much larger pipes. And, and this is a pretty cool video I had. Oops, let me just pause this for a second. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. So this this is a system a couple of miles from my house, um, and you know I knew it was kind of a tragic yield. There was a, this is real sandy soils. This is a real wet year. A guy died on this. Um, you know they were laying trenches back in, in this part of the system, and, and it caved in and, and it died on them. But but you know so the, what they did was they they stopped working on the system from that point through the end of the year. And the existing tile, which was a, an old 30-inch 30, 30 pipe, that quit working. So what, what this allowed me, or what happened in the landscape then, was it kind of reverted back to the prairie pothole region. And so I got my drone up and I flew it when it was, you know, when it was wet. And then uh, again in March, after they, they got the, the old system uh, working again, and it's quite a contrast. So take a look at the size of the equipment here and the size of these pipes. And this is only six square miles. Yep. I'm sorry. Did they have to design a, a stormwater protection plan for a development like this? What? No, I, I think, I, I forget. <laughs> Sometimes you don't even need a permit. I think, and, and maybe you guys can answer this better than I can, is it? If you're if there's any kind of a wetland in the system, you have to get NRCS out to make sure you're you're not draining that. But there's a few wetlands out there now. But, but I, I think is that kind of encompass because uh, I've asked a couple of different people in our agency, and and agriculture is more or less exempt from the Clean Water Act. So so yeah, it's yeah you would think. Okay, so now I'm going to get my drone up, and and this uh, these pictures are taken in November. So if you look at the surrounding landscape, you're not going to see any water. You can see all the crops are out. Okay, now I'm um, almost to the end of this, and I'm going to turn my drone around so you guys can kind of see the you know the area that this encompasses. So lots of water in that landscape. So now we're I'm flying this east, and we had this is really cool. This road right here, the, the groundwater table came up, and they had a closer road all all summer long. So this isn't the result of rain. This is just the result of not being drained. And in fact, a friend of mine, his his father grew up out in this area. He lives about six miles from this town called Lake Crystal. Okay, now the tile um, they they fixed this in the existing system in March, and this is the the same the, the same landscape. But uh, my father's friend, he used to, um, you know, he's 95 years old, so he's, he's seen a lot uh, out here. But he used to be able to canoe in wet years from his house seven miles away to Lake Crystal without getting out of his canoe once. It's that, kind of, that different of landscape. So that kind of gives you a feel for the amount of water that these mainstream. That was six square miles. I live in the Watwan River watershed, and, uh, um, oh gosh, I forget how many. I think it's 500 square miles, you know, so there could conceivably be like, you know, 90 to 100 of these systems just in one acre. That's, that's, that's a lot of water. But but this is all fueled, you know, back to the original point here. This is all fueled a tremendous amount of stream bank erosion. It's, it's just absolutely incredible what I see, the amount of erosion from year to year. So what we know, uh, number four, major sources of sediment to the Blue Earth River and its tributaries are from stream banks, ravines, gullies, and, and field erosion. 
Which sediment source is the largest contributor to the Lewis River? Well, kind of depends. Sorry, I was kind of kind of cheating. So, but and and we'll we'll take a look at we'll we'll go into this this application that I uh, that I didn't create that some of that I created, but um, and and we'll take a look at just how some of these dynamics can can change. But I put this up to give you an idea of. When you get a high intensity event and you have overland flow occurring, um, this is what happens. This is a, a real small system called Seven Mile Creek. It's it's kind of like the Lassur in that it's 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 entrenched. You know, it it, it goes down uh, a couple hundred feet from the surrounding uplands. It does flow through, or it, it goes through a lot of sandstone, so it's real different from the, from a bank sediment standpoint. But the fuel erosion, you know, drains from some, some agricultural uplands. And the gullies exist, so those two components are very much like the sewer, <laughs> and we see real similar dynamics. But by kind of min minimizing that stream bank bluff contribution, you can really see what happens overland flow wise. So this is turbidity. We've got a, an in-stream turbidity probe, and uh, the top of the scale is 1550 NTUs. The standard used to be 25 NTUs. We now switch to a, a TSS standard, but that's really dirty. In fact, you know, it went off the charts. Yeah, the, it was, you know, the, the top TSS concentrations were that high. But what I want you to see is just how short lived this is. It's, you know, the blue line is flow, so we had a couple of, you know, pulses of high intensity events, and and the turbidity values. This is, you know, well, it's actually in that sample set about. But you know, this is what the, the water would look like at the base of this. <clears throat> that was a, a composite sample that was collected at the, the peak of this event. But you can see how turbid that water is. You know, so you've got you've got fields contributing, you've got gullies contributing, but it's, again, it's like a parking lot. You know, it, it's you know, field you know, coming off fields, maybe a day. You know, a couple of days, you really get a big event. Um, but it does a tremendous amount of motion. You know, you get a lot of sediment coming from the field, but the gullies were horrible. They, they were really horrible. Um, between each one of these lines, it's about 12 hours. So you can see how, how much that changes. This system, you will often see four or five days a year, you know, come through 70 percent of the TSS Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, we actually moved the site up a little bit. You know, the existing site, you know, that was in the flat part of the, the, um, the, the valley. And... You know, sort of then come screaming down the hill and we'd be buried under two feet of sand and you know, sort of kind of right at the base of the slope now. So it stays clean. Okay, so now I'm going to show you guys the, the data viewer that we've got. So all of this data, you, basically everything that I showed you, you know, that's just kind of an example of how you can use this data. Everything that we have is on this application that uh, I had a, a guy by the name of Casey Scott create. Where you can you can basically pull up pretty much all the maps that I had you know that I've shown you, and you can download all the data. So I mean, if you guys I know you two are, are going to be looking for data, this is a, a great app for that. But we created this because we used to have static maps. You know, basically the slide is saying we had everything in, in hard copies. We had static maps. You know, we had spreadsheets and you know daily data. We've got you know. One and a half million plus records, you know, we make a spreadsheet of that. So, so you know, like I was telling you earlier, I ran across this guy and, and he put this together. So we've got we've got a basically a tab on the top, and and I've got this loaded dynamically. I'll just go through this real quick, and then we can pull it up. But we've got basically the the browser tab is the the one on the top on the far left, and then we have download tabs next to our download tabs. When you're on the browser, we have another series of um, uh, tabs in the, in this lower ribbon, and and the first one is uh, it, it's basically a site map. If you click on these, any one of those sites, it'll it'll bring up this little box, and if you click on that, it takes you to a, a website called the the DNR MPCA Cooperative Stream Gauging website, and that basically it's got our our flow and stage data, and we also have a, a little bit of a, an introduction into you know, the, the sites that we have. The average values, when I showed you the state maps, the nitrogen, phosphorus, um, sediment, we, we've got a series of filters here, so you can select total phosphorus, TSS, nitrate plus nitrite, nitrogen, 
you can look at the pull weight mean concentrations, you can look at the load, you know, the mass, um, or the, the yield, you can also look at the volume for the year. And then you can select the, the site type down in the, the, the lower selections here. So this is this is really nice. And if you wanted to just see the values for, for one of the watersheds, you could just click on that and, and all the values would pull up in this table that's that's down below. In fact, that's uh, that's what we did here. So so we clicked on the uh, Little Sewer River, and it tells us that we have data from 2007 through 2015, and the average flow weight and mean concentration is 256 milligrams per liter. The stats for the other parameters are in this table down below. So that's that's I I, will, I, I like that tool quite a bit. Um, every year is is unique. Um, boy, I wish I would have put loads here because you see huge differences in loads. But um, but what, what you can do is you can take a look at all the annual values with, with the second tab. Um, if I wanted to, right now, uh, the, the number that popped up, uh, Casey had selected, this is one of his slides, had selected the Lassure, and you can see that the flow weight of meat concentration is 226 milligrams a liter. If for some reason you thought uh, 2010 was an anomaly and you wanted to, to exclude that, so you can uncheck it and it'll recalculate the flow weight of mean concentration. But but this is great data, you know, just to see the, the annual variability. Um, if you want to see when the samples are collected, uh, if we, you know, if, if, we'll, if we don't have any samples on this event, it's pretty much missed it for the year. Um, you know, so this graph I had put in just so you can get in and take a look at the quality of the data. And and this is my favorite, the, the daily stuff. If if you want to know about your watersheds, get in and take a look at the daily data. That's that's where it's all at. I mean, the the other stuff it says, yeah, this is a bad area, but it doesn't tell you why. This stuff does. Um, so what's what's cool about this? Right now I have this is um, two sites, the Sewer River and the Strait River, and I've got the, with the filters I've got CSS selected. We're looking at mass, um, but I had. I had Casey add the percentage of the annual load as one of the, 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 the values on, on this um, pop out table, or whatever you want to call it, because this is so important. You know, I wanted people to see what I'm saying, and it's, you know, sometimes you get a big event and that's it. You know, I mean, that's it for the whole year. And, and the rest of the time, yeah, it's, you know, it's significant, but, you know, if your goal is to reduce the overall load downstream, this is the kind of stuff you need to know and you need to target. Um, if, in this example, I pointed at, at this bar on June 17th or 16th, whatever, or 18th, and we can see that the flow is 6,800 CFS, a percentage of the load from the selected period, um, and we're going from May through July, that's 80% uh, of the load. Percent of the load on that one day alone, 24%, but, but, but huge. And let's see, I think it's the same, same graph twice. And then we've got uh, a couple of tabs at the end, instructions, you know, how to download the data. And then if you're totally unfamiliar with this, you know, what a concentration is, a load, yield, uh, we, we've got a, a map, I, I cut it off, but we've got water quality standards for TP and TSS, and they're shown on that map, you know, so you can go back and, and take a look and, and uh, you know, kind of put those numbers in perspective. So I do have, I've got the data loader loaded up right here. But here's, well, first of all, you, well, I guess we're, we're almost there. Let me, let me show you one thing here. It's, it's pretty cool. You know, when this sits for a while, it kind of reloads. So let me show you a, a more of a natural system and one that's kind of impaired here. So Big Fork River, that's up in northern Minnesota, and the Blue Earth River. I'm telling you now, it's the Blue Earth. This this page takes a little while to to, to load, and then telling you what's you know 2014 is kind of cool here. Yeah, I need a. <laughs> something to pause this so I can make all my changes without ever having, having to wait every time I change something. So I've got to change the end date here too. Uh, let's see. Oh, shit. Pardon me. Forget 
So this should zoom in on Okay, so we've got the big fork on the top, and we've got the Lassur on the bottom, and this is that 2014 event. But but this is the signature that you see. Remember that graph, and I showed you that turbidity probe. This is the signature that says, hey, you know what? Every source was contributing. You, you look at this, con this concentration at whatever the flow is, 11,000 <laughs> CFS. You go to this side of the hydrograph at 11,000 CFS. And you're going to see that concentration is one tenth the value on the rising limb. There's something going on other than just stream bank and bluff erosion. But if we go to the big four, this is more of a natural system. And, and so what you'll see is you'll see concentrations similar on the rising and the recession limbs. And, and same thing with the lows. You know, a little bit of variability. You know, big four certainly didn't have any suspension at the beginning of these events. You know, there's a little bit of overland flow, but for the most part, that's a very natural system. So this is the kind of information that you can really, you can really pull out of this. Um, I know we've got an inorganic nitrate fan or two, and this is this is a very different signature. Basically, with nitrate nitrogen, when the water's going through the system, you take a look at these concentrations, and down here we're in blue. You know, so this is ag, we're at you know 10, 12, 15. Um, concentrations on the top are going to be like nothing. In fact, these are most of these are at the detection level. So uh, 15 micrograms versus 15 milligrams. So a huge difference. But but here's what's really interesting. You know, the concentrations don't vary much. So basically, uh, a load is a concentration times flow. And so you're going to see the daily loads pretty much just model the hydrogen. So if you want to figure out when the, or, you know, with this app, if you wanted to figure out when the nitrogen, the nitrogen is going down in the system, you can usually figure out that, you know, it's, it's when the flow is going down. And, and I heard, you know, somebody's interested in, in base flow and nitrogen concentrations and loads, and they're pretty insignificant. You know, I, I, and, and it's, I don't mean to throw water on uh, what you're doing, but I see, I, I see, you know, like bioreactors and, and BMPs that treat low flows. And, you know, if you really want to make a dent in that nitrate populate or nitrate, you know, concentration or load, that's not what you target. But this information will help you figure that stuff out. So, so I, I've only kind of touched on this. If you guys want to pull this up, write down WPLMN, our website. It takes me 10 minutes to find it on our website. So I just Google this. And and you'll get there much much quicker. But if you if you just Google WPLM, this is our, our data viewer. So, and and that's you know I I run my my course here. So, on well, Now do you guys have questions? Yes. Oh uh, yeah, I have a question. You know, um, my Surprising. understanding is that the uh, TMDLs are based a lot on grass apples. And uh, the concentrations that you measure in storm events are mm -hmm. not considered when a TMDL is developed. Is that, okay. still the, is that still the case for the most part? Yeah, it's you know with with our program, we've we've really tried to check a lot of stuff out. We, we'll do mass balances, um, you know, to make sure that you know these three additive sites come pretty damn close to this downstream, you know, like black and down number three. You know, we'll add them up and make sure that you know we don't have big gross differences in numbers. But with TSS, we have a contract with USGS. Um, we've got a, several sites where they go out and they'll do they'll do uh, uh, their, their EWI samples that are equal with depth and integrated samples. And they'll, they'll compare that to a surface grab. And, you know, so we can kind of see the difference between that integrated sample and surface grab. And with TSS, you know, we're, we're definitely in the ballpark, you know, it wouldn't be every site, you know, but something like the Lusso where we try and get well-mixed areas. It's, it's seems to be pretty representative, you know, so, so yeah, the, there really isn't any adjustment, but I, I'm pretty comfortable with, you know, our, our, our grabs versus the, the composites or the, the with the uh, definite samples. You know, it's not perfect, but 
you know, I look at this as more of an index than, you know, than, than absolute accurate values. You know, and, and if you look at SSC and TSS2, you know, they're, they're quite different. You know, and, and this, this contract, USGS is comparing SSC to TSS to see, you know, how big the difference is. So does that answer your question? We, we are, you know, no would be the right answer. But it <laughs> took me a long time to get there, yes. In the Minnesota River Basin, the most valuable data with regard to sediment that I've seen in terms of distinguishing sources comes from when you take Mullis boat and also sister groups, monitor above the next zone and below the next zone so you can subtract off what's happening in the next zone right. from the output. Then you can determine what type of practices are going to be useful, whether it's local control type practices or upland erosion control practices. So how many of those tributaries, especially in the Blue Earth area, are monitored continuously above the next zone and below the next zone? Well the the data that AMS had used, that's that's our data. So so the the sites that they used um, uh, on the Maple, where we've got a site at the top and bottom of the next zone, and in Lesur, we've got uh, we've got one on County Road Eight, which is kind of midway down. Or Lesur, you know, there isn't a real definitive nick point. I mean, it's just kind of a uh, rolling more in. Right, right. But uh, but we also I, I had the St. Clair Gauge, which was farther upstream. You know, pretty close to you know what you would define as the nick point on Lesur. I had that installed a couple of years ago just because that was just such valuable information. So, so yeah, we do try and, and, and capture that. Um, uh, the Blue Earth we've got, you know, Blue Earth is weird with Rapid and Dam, but, uh, but we do try and, and, and capture that when that dynamic exists. Oh, for sure. Right. So right. What, what kind of correction do you need to make for that? Uh, sort of, maybe no correction. Yeah, you know, we, we use it just to see what's going on. You know, you can never have enough data. You know, I, I just, I like redundancy. I, I really do. And that system is, you know, we're, we're, we're doing grab samples. Something like Seven Mile Creek, a daily grab sample, you don't capture. You, you really don't. So we've got the uh, Department of Ag, they've got a sampler there, a composite sample. Uh, sampler, but yeah, the that's I don't like samplers just because of that. If you put them out where they should be, or that intake where it should be, it's going to get ripped out. And then if you tuck it on the bank, you know, does that really represent? You know, so so yeah, uh, I, I I know exactly where you're coming from, and and yeah, there's there's certain certainly drawbacks with that. I know that the transportation Okay. Quantify uh, where the best place is sure. in the water column. Okay. Measure the okay. I don't know what the results are. Yeah, if you if you can find that out, the, the, or when the results are. Yeah. Okay, excellent. There. You can put to me one of the prospects that one could actually reduce PSS to negative. Um. You know, I, I think you could do it, uh, but I think regulation would have to happen first. Um, you know, I, I, what I, regulation? what's that? What would you do? Uh, you know what I, 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 residue is great. I, I like yeah. residue a lot. Uh, a one rod buffer, you know, that's, that's not going to do it. You know, if you, if you really put, you know, some, some good buffers on, on these systems from a ditch to the river, that would that would help a lot. Uh, ravines, you, you just don't you don't put tile in ravines. You know that's it's just common sense. You know, and if you can put berms and uh, Seven Mile Creek, they've done a great job addressing those ravines. They've got a lot of uh, lost cobs. You know, so it's a berm and a, 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 a much downsized pipe. You know, to to let that stuff out the water out slowly, and they'll drop it down. Some of the pipes go all the way down the you know down the wall. You know, so there's there's ways to do it. That's, yes, very much so. So that's you know kind of the, the approach I'd go, but I, 
you know, as far as voluntary, man, I've seen corn at a buck some, you know, uh, a bushel. I've seen it at, you know, nine dollars a bushel. And you know, when it's a dollar a bushel, I, I remember even Dave Ward and you know Dave, you're a great guy, he worked for corn growers. And and Dave goes, God, you know, Pat, he said, you know, at a buck twenty five, he said, man, we gotta we gotta we gotta plant everything. You know, I gotta put my kids through college. And then when it was, you know, nine ten bucks a bushel, and you you know, he goes. Well, you're crazy if I think I'm going to put that in, you know, CRP or crap or whatever. And, you know, so so there's just, there's so much to this. You know, I, I see there's, there's times when it's economically feasible or, or it's a good economic option to retire that land or put it in some kind of set-aside program. And then other times where, you know, the economics say they're cool to keep it in. And, you know, so I just see this oscillation of BMPs go in, BMPs come out, a lot of time, a lot of money spent, you know, through that course, so I don't know. I, I from a voluntary standpoint, I, I don't think you know, that would be enough. But that's my opinion. Yes. So I guess. Uh, Sorry, you guys in the back. I'll, I'll get you. I oh. No. You you mentioned talking with the public more um, than some of the other conventions that we've had. You obviously go to great lengths to get interesting media to present, and I'm just wondering, um, as a student, if there's any formal training you did to kind of develop those skills or if it was more pick things up here and there, develop your own style for it? Yeah, it was, um, you know, just kind of learn as I go. I mean, obviously you can tell I've got a little bit of a passion for this. And, and I, I think that's fueled me more than anything else. And, you know, I, I don't like to, you know, I've been so fortunate in, in this job. I mean, like I said, I, I live on the river, I play on the river. And I work on the river. You know, I, I really see what's going on. You know, and these numbers help me quantify and show the difference between this storm and, and that storm. So, I don't know. I had a friend that, you know, he used to always say, well, you can't coach experience. And that's kind of what it is. I mean, I, I spent the, the first 10, 12 years of my job, I put in monitoring sites, and I drove around the Minnesota River Basin all the time. And I learned so much from that. You know, I learned so much from that. You know, I, I don't like doing that anymore. Um, although I, I miss it because, you know, every year for 12 years I've done this stuff. So, I don't know, it's it's just always trying to, when you get something done, look at what you're going to do next. You know, for, for me, the biggest holdups have been politics, basically. You know, it's, it kind of depends on who's in office, and the legacy funding has been just fabulous. You know, I mean, that's really opened up a lot for us. So, I don't know if that answers your question, or, you know, I didn't. Do anything other than be passionate. Right. And and there was you know a couple of classes that I, I took here that were key. I, I took uh, uh, Calvin Alexander he had a surface water chemistry class, and that was that was that was really good. I, I like that. You know, it, it just I'm able to you know, I mean chemistry wise, you know, I've got a daughter graduate, uh, she's going to get her master's in it. You know, and I had no idea what she talks about anymore. But, you know, at least I learned the fundamentals and was able to hold on to those. Now, Satish, yep. Yeah, you have some maps that you throw early on. Yep. You bet. Yep. I can get my glasses here. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, what's that? Yeah, I'm not sure I can, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure I can see this. Oh, here. Let me. No, that's okay. Uh, you know that one of the by uh, Tim Lushkow? You know, the lady sure. Left. Yep. Uh, from 2008, he had something similar, and he showed that uh, from a lot of bubble of watershed, that there is 27 pounds of sediment on the other land. It's the total amount that he has. Okay. Left. You know, some of that, uh, the, the earlier data, that was CWP data. Well, I would, I never trust anything in my job. You know, if I see something that's so far off, I go, okay, did we not get the samples? Did the lab roof up? You know, that's that's kind of where I start. And and with lack of power, um, we had a person out there, she was a great person, but, you know, it was a CWP contract. And because when we started pulling in lack of power numbers, I'm going, wow, these are way different than what's been done before. 
and it was just it was kind of the, the so can you Okay, so um, uh, let's see. try and expand that a little bit. Okay, um, so you want to look at it. Okay. In in the well, I mean it's well, sure. So the the yellow are are you talking? Okay. Up. Okay. Up here. Okay. Um, I mean you, you don't have a river that's two hundred feet below the surrounding uplands, so you don't have. Well, yeah, you can have bank erosion, you can have field erosion where the yellow is. Well, you know, I would say um, you've got less stream energy. You've got one less source of sediment. Um, these numbers are, let's see what we've got here. Oh, shoot, that's not the interactive one. It doesn't matter. It's okay. Just, I think the point is you're getting less rainfall in the western side and you're getting more rainfall in the southern side. Well, certainly that, that contributes, and without a doubt. Banks are very far in the southern part than in the northern part. Okay? So, what kind of management? Well, that's assuming that rainfall is what's, you know, if, if I'm reading you right, you're, you're kind of assuming everything else is equal except the amount of total rainfall. Well, rainfall and the bank. Oh, right, right. But I, I think there's more to it. You also have... I'm sure there's more to it. Right. The point is, what kind of practice can you do right. to fix that? Yeah. And what I'm doing is that well, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. No, it's... Yeah, that is one of the problems. I mean, if you have a Minnesota River Basin with all the tile, you know, we're not going to turn back the hands of tile. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's not that tile, it's a basin. Well, well, <laughs> Satish, we'll carry that one on when the class is over. Any any other questions back here? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so some of these gray areas up here? Yeah, this this is basically Lake of the Woods. You know, we're you know, most of that watershed, you know, drains into Lake of the Woods, and so our site would be coming out of the lake. You know, so we thought, well, we're not a lake monitoring um, program. But I think, you know, I think we're gonna, you know, everybody asks that question, so we'll <laughs> we'll we'll compute lake loads. Just you know, one last question. Lake of the Woods, Red Lake. Or Red Lake, yeah. Hey, I'm, yes, Red Lake. I'm sorry. Thank you. Ed. All right, let's get that hand. Thank you. All right.